Thank you, Graham, for joining us today for the Resilience interview. And you're welcome. It seems to me that the word resilience has become very popular, and I just wonder sometimes whether it's in danger of being overused. Um, so I was thinking, from your perspective, what do you find most interesting about resilience? I think that very concept that it's now become so overused that we've lost the plot on what it probably means. Um, essentially, there's, there's three ways of thinking about it. One is the extent to which people can survive stress, um, the way to which people can uh, make the best use of their stressful situations and the ways in which people can flourish in their situations. Um, and I think one, one set of thinking leads to a very, very bleak um, way of thinking about the human condition. And the other one leads to a much more optimistic and hopeful way. And I'm much more on the optimistic and hopeful way um, of thinking about things, where I think that resilience is, 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 a, is a helpful way of thinking about how the average human being is able to do well in the midst of extreme stress. Is that, is, is that view that you have there a common view, or is it more likely that people uh, professionally would think of the kind of less positive view of, of resilience? Um, maybe being a bit cynical, I think there's an awful lot of money to be made from the idea that you need to rescue people from these nasty situations, which has um, overwhelmed them, and unless they get certain sorts of professional help, then they can't possibly survive. And actually, the science and the statistics is against that. There's undoubtedly people out there who do need some professional help, but there are a minority of those who go through um, nasty, difficult situations. There's an awful lot of science beginning to emerge on um, how we flourish um, in uh, the aftermath of stressful situations or traumatic situations. But I think that's less well known. Um, and again, being slightly cynical, there's probably less money to be made in that. So I'd just like to emphasize this. You're, you're suggesting that statistically the majority of people don't get significantly psychologically damaged because of events that occur within their lives. I think that's a really important point. Statistically, um, overwhelmingly more than 90% of people um, will survive a traumatic incident um, without long-term damage. Now, there's no doubt that there is a, um, a moderate timeline. Um, we're talking about days, weeks and months where, yes, people will be affected by it. But that's part of the normal human condition. It, it, I often talk about bereavement. You know, if somebody very, very dear to you dies, you are going to become what could be termed clinically depressed. But actually, society calls that bereavement or grieving and it's seen as a normal process. It's very much the same sort of thing after a very, very bad incident. After you've been in a car accident, the body's going to go into shock. That's not a clinical emergency. It's a way of um, us dealing with the aftermath of what has happened. Um, if you go through a particularly nasty set of situations, then you may become symptomatic in all sorts of ways that mimic post-traumatic stress disorder. For example, to take a very popular diagnosis nowadays. Um, but for the first month, clinicians simply call that acute stress reaction. Um, it's seen as normal. It's not seen as anything uh, that's an emergency or anything to worry about. Um, a lot of people are going to go through that. But the symptoms of that are exactly the same as PTSD. The only difference between acute stress reaction and post-traumatic stress disorder is that um, acute stress reaction are those symptoms that happen in the month following the incident, and post-traumatic stress disorder are the same symptoms if they're still occurring more than a month after the, dis uh, the incident. So if we were to think of the analogy of the iceberg, with uh, the smallest amount of the iceberg being above the water, and the bulk of it generally below the water, um, are you suggesting that what we see of the iceberg above the water is really the significant traumatic response to um, events that go on in life? But for the bulk of people, we, are, we form the bulk of the iceberg beneath the water that aren't really significantly traumatically damaged by events in life. That's right. We're not significantly damaged in the long term. I need to keep on emphasising that. There's undoubtedly uh, an impact in the um, first couple of weeks, the first couple of months, uh, maybe up to a year after the event. Um, but that's not long-term damage, um, although people can feel damage during that in initial incident. But in exactly the same way as they would when they are bereaved or grieving, 
um, or going through other normal um, life events. Um, it doesn't mean to say that they are long-term damaged in, in any way or that they're weak. It is a normal part of the human condition. You are really placing time and the passage of time as being a key variable in in how we look at um, resilience and trauma. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, th there's, there's not an awful lot of science behind this. Um, we roughly divvy it up into the first month, the first three months, and then the first year. Um, if you're symptomatic in the first month, um, we're not too worried about that, but that's just simply a definition that's been made up by a committee somewhere. There's no particular science behind it. Um, during the first, uh, the, the, the next one to three months, um, people may have the same symptoms and may benefit from a, a small amount of help, nothing too, nothing too intense uh, during that time from a counsellor or a, a psychologist. Um, who can help them talk their way through the situation in a particular kind of way. And that's generally re uh, viewed as a particular kind of memory problem. Not that you're forgetting things, but that you're over-remembering them and processing them in the wrong part of your brain. Um, th more than three months out, it's likely that anybody who is still symptomatic after three months is going to continue to be symptomatic um, unless they get some sort of intervention. But again, people can recover, become non-symptomatic because they've gone through the one year anniversary um, and there's less to remind them of what's going on. Hmm. So then if, if we think of, you know, profiles of human beings, we can say that, you know, I'm a certain height, I'm a certain weight, um, there's been some changes in my height and my weight over the course of my life. Can, can we separate resilience out in a symbol, similar way and say, a person has a certain amount of resilience that they they are born with, that they carry with them over life? Yeah, I can look at it in, in that kind of way. Um, I think we tend to look at um, these issues in terms of vulnerability, so it, it, it's a bit more bleak um, rather than the more positive approach. Um, but you can take the positive approach by being the opposite of what the vulnerabilities are. Right. Um, there's very little to suggest that there's a genetic flavour to this, um, and I, uh, as I go on to describe it, you'll see why, because there's no one gene that can describe, or a, um, a, a cluster of genes that can describe all the phenomena that I'm talking about. Um, but certainly people are vulnerable to post-traumatic stress disorder, um, to the effects of uh, going through trauma, going through bad experiences, to the extent that they... Um, their upbringing has been one which has provided them with what we call in the trade secure attachments. In other words, that they um, they feel secure in their environment um, because they internally they feel secure. They feel content with themselves. They feel content with people around them. They feel content with the world around them. Um, a very interesting phenomenon that we um, talked about a lot in, in the aid world, in, in particular um, in the part of the aid world that's religious, whether it be uh, Christian or Islam or any other sort of uh, religious belief um, or any sort of humanistic belief, was Janeth Bullman um, back in the latter half of last century looking at the um, shattering of assumptions. And uh, people whose um, assumption, assumptions are shattered in the midst of trauma um, do have a very bad time afterwards and do have all sorts of you know, quite difficult symptoms to deal with. But the clue is actually in the, um, in the metaphor. Um, you can only shatter something which is a crystalline structure. You can only shatter something which is solid. And what we found in the in the aid world, and in particular, um, people who were motivated by some sort of transcendent calling to go into aid work, whatever whatever source that might be, if they held those beliefs very very rigidly, then those beliefs encountered something which overwhelmed those beliefs and the realities of, for example, a refugee camp. Um, then something had to give way, and it was often their worldview which then had a mental health consequence. So we began to think more and more in terms of how to select people on that basis. We wanted people with more of a, a fluid approach to life. So if you have very, very rigid beliefs, um, you're unlikely to transition a trauma which overwhelms that worldview um, particularly well. Um, 
also increasingly we're, we're getting interested in uh, what it, again in the trade we're calling transdiagnostics. Um, and the easiest way to think about a transdiagnostic is um, a fever. If you have a fever um, and you ask most people what would they do, most people would say, well, I'd take an aspirin, which is fine, providing you don't have malaria. What you want to do is take the pill that would cure malaria. Um, in other words, a fever is a symptom of something which can result from many, many, many different uh, diseases or, or illnesses. The same with a cough. If you have a cough, what do you take? You probably take cough medicine, which again is fine, providing you don't have tuberculosis. So um, a symptom is simply um, something which can occur from many, many, many different things. So just because you have PTSD does not mean to say that that PTSD or that anxiety or whatever it might happen to be relates back to a particular incident um, and that you're doomed because you've gone through that incident. There are going to be some what we call intervening variables in the reaction. And one of the ones that we're very, very interested in at the moment is something called rumination or cognitive rumination, which is the extent to which we ask questions about a past event. Um, now, the, the questions that we often ask when, um, for example, our car breaks down because we've got a puncture is, how do I fix the puncture? Um, where's the nearest car mechanic? Um, where's the number for the emergency rescue service that I'm signed up to? Where's my mobile phone so I can phone them? Do I have a signal? Those sorts of very problem thinking, um, very problem focused cognitions. And you better believe for the next 30 minutes after the puncture, we are going to be ruminating. You fix the puncture and you stop ruminating. And that's the way in which rumination is designed. It's supposed to switch on, give us a very intense experience around problem solving um, and then shut off. Because we're human beings, we can actually take it one step further. We can ask much more metaphorical, existential questions about the event. Um, what if I hadn't driven over the pothole? Why me? Why did I get involved in this situation? If only I turned right, or if only I turned left, if only I'd taken a different route, etc. And those sorts of ruminations are very, very human. They're actually essentially what makes us human, that we're able to think um, in scenarios around the bad event that has just happened. Um, and this is basically why we made it off the savannah and off the hills and became the civilization that we are now, because we learned that if the mountain lion attacks us from a particular direction, we'll go via a different route. If only I'd gone via a different route, etc. So it's, it's, a, it's an evolutionary a good idea. What we find psychologically with some people, but not all, is that that particular thinking style gets stuck. Mm -hmm. And so they have a car accident and they think, if only I hadn't dr um, driven over that child and killed them. If only I turned right, if only I turned left. And they go over and over and over and over the same situation multiple times. But instead of doing it in a problem solving way, they get stuck, they bring up the same emotions time and time and time again and become symptomatic of something that looks remarkably like PTSD but isn't. Mm -hmm. um, so they would they will talk, they won't talk about having flashbacks, they will talk about replaying the scene like a video. Um, they will still talk about the um, the experience of the incident as happening yesterday or you know very very recently. It feels very very recent but that's because they keep on thinking about it. Well, if I was um, ordinary people, when we ask them and do the, the science around this, you know, how many different thoughts we have a day, we probably have tens of thousands of thoughts a day. People who are chronically ruminating in this kind of way will probably only have a couple of hundred thoughts a day, most of which are around the past event, and they will spend hours every day ruminating on the past event. They can't get away from it. Um, lovely bit of work that was done by Anke Ellers' um, lab in London a couple of years ago, followed up hundreds of people who have been involved in, in uh, a car accident and have been through the accident and emergency um, ER rooms uh, in London and found that um, a small number of them were set to be these what if, if only, why me kind of ruminators. They tended to be like that. The majority of people weren't. Followed them up 18 months later and found that those who were the what if, why me, if only style of ruminators were the very ones who were apparently symptomatic of PTSD. Mm -hmm. Clinically at that stage, you 
don't go after the PTSD symptoms, you go after the rumination style, mm. uh, and that's how you then begin to work on it. So we've got a number of different vulnerabilities there, none of which point particularly towards, um, towards genetics, um, which can begin to give us some clues about how to select aid workers, select refugee workers, select emergency workers, um, who will not be overwhelmed um, in the long-term aftermath of the nasty things that they see. Uh, and there, there are quite a few examples of those sorts of approaches. You know, it almost sounds to me like there's a developmental component to to what you've been talking about in the sense that it's not just whether I'm going to go and work in a refugee camp, but it could be there's a significant change in my life. Um, my job may have changed. Um, my kids may have left home. I may have got married or, or got divorced or a spouse may have died. And... And so my worldview gets shattered because of that um, experience, but my resilience gives me some possibilities for for growing through this. Uh, if I spend too much time in, in ruminating, in, in the words you used, too much time on this over and over and over again, if I get stuck in that process of ruminating, then I might find myself exhibiting symptoms that, that professionals may identify as being profoundly psychologically damaging. But that also gives to me, and tell me if I'm wrong on this, it gives to me the idea that there's hope in this, that if I can learn how not to overly ruminate, not overly to dwell on things, that I have there a depth of resilience and expertise and experience that I can use to help me to not only get through this, but actually grow as a result of being through this. Is, is that kind of a fair personal summation of what you said? Absolutely. Um, I, I think it, it is a very, very hopeful part of the human condition. Um, and uh, I, I don't want to underplay the um, necessity of thinking about this as part of the normal human condition. Um, we, we learn from our bad experiences, um, and sometimes they're quite hard, quite harsh lessons. Um, but if somebody dear to me dies, it would be absurd, almost obscene, for me to simply carry on with my life as if nothing had happened. It is going to profoundly um, affect me. And yet I can, I can, in a sense, learn from that, grieve, um, celebrate, rejoice, mourn um, the loss of that particular person. Um, there is... Embedded in all of this, um, again, a fairly n seems normal process, but it's not very well understood yet, um, although there is some quite good science beginning to emerge. So this is out of the, the work of uh, Tedeschi and Kaloon and others um, in the States, um, looking at a phenomenon called post-traumatic growth. And this is... <laughs> I hesitate to use the word transcendent, but it is definitely more than some of the parts of it, if you know what I mean, uh, in terms of something nasty happens to us, and then some years later, something quite remarkable happens. And, and by some years later, I'm often talking in terms of five to ten years, where the, the person grows through the experience of the bad things that have happened, and something happens to their connection with the world, something happens with their connection to um, a power or a, a um, a concept greater than them. Um, something happens to their compassion. And what happens is that they feel a greater connectedness to the world around them. They're more grateful for the everyday. Um, the phrase we often use, which is well known, is they, they take more time to stop and smell the roses. Not because they want to, but because they're rejoicing and celebrating in the fact that they, they could have had the ability, to, they might have lost the ability to smell the roses, but didn't something keeps them here in this beautiful situation. They're much more able to be empathic because they've walked where many people haven't. Um, the experience of going through a car crash and nearly dying, the experience of being overwhelmed completely by the needs of a refugee camp um, aren't something that everybody shares. But because you've gone that extra mile, as it were, it does mean that you are more able to sympathise, empathise, with people who are going through difficult situations, and they in turn have the feeling that you at a very deep level understand them. Mm. There tends to be a greater sense of connectedness to the, the meaning of the world, the meaning of what's going on around them, um, however that is um, thought about in their particular experience or mind.
Let me pick up on one of the things that you said there, Graham, and I was just thinking about it because resilience is protective, but there's also the possibility or the likelihood, in fact, that I could grow and develop. Do mm-hmm. I actually have to go through some kind of major trauma in order to get this this growth? Or are there other ways in which ordinary human beings who don't have those those major traumatic events can continue to grow and and flourish, you know, using the resilience in order to do that? There's no idea. Don't know. But we've got a number of different ideas out there. Um, we are thinking that there needs to be some sort of disjunctive event, something which interrupts the normal trajectory of our um, development as uh, particularly as adults. Um, so there needs to be a, a, a break, some sort of, uh, as I say, some sort of chaos or disjunction or break in the normal trajectory. Now, now this can be um, a life event, but it's it's less likely to lead to the, um, the uh, post-traumatic growth phenomenon that I'm talking about in quite the same way. Um, I'd sort of need a whiteboard to explain this properly, and we don't have one, but it goes something like, if you imagine that we are basically um, trundling along um, in our uh, development, and, and steadily day by day by day, we're maybe growing, learning, maturing, developing, things are moving on, but they're going up in some sort of line. We might plateau for a bit, we might go up for a bit, it's not an even line, but there is some sort of trajectory. What happens in the um, disjunction, the um profoundness of maybe i don't know falling in love and our life takes a completely different uh, trajectory or having a road traffic accident there's a there's a gap there's a hiatus and then you come back online at a much different level in your terms of your development um the the debate that's going on at the moment is we don't know whether this trajectory is carrying on in the same direction or whether it actually takes off at right angles. Mm-hmm. In other words, it's more of a something very, very profound happens, which means that it's not us but moved on and accelerated in our process or jumped in our process, but something quite profound happens and changes us. Now, it, we're having trouble getting after that, um, but... Uh, we can hear it in the in the narratives of people uh, who talk about post traumatic growth, where where they will report that their friends, family, loved ones around them will say that they've changed profoundly. They're not the same person they used to be. Um, they're not the same, but a bit better. They're not the same, but a bit more kind. Um, but they are somehow profoundly changed. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, as I say, we 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 haven't quite found the science to be able to get after what that phenomenon is. But it's an oft heard remark. Because then, as we draw this to a close, I'm going to have to let you go soon. But it seems to me that there's a, from what you're talking about there, there's a big question about whether I can uh, intentionally introduce such a process for me or whether it has to happen randomly in my life to create this moment, this juncture at which I am now potentially open to this growth. And I, I, I would prefer myself, because I'm, I like to be an optimist, would prefer to think that there's some things I could do for myself that might bring me to you know, in, increased knowledge, understanding, awareness, um, increased flourishing, rather than having to wait for some kind of you know, thing to come along and whack me in the head and, and turn me to this. I mean, is there hope in the sense that you can think of, that you can encourage people to think about the intentionality of um, you know using using our resilience to grow, to develop, to thrive. Probably the the biggest hope that would would uh, uh, contribute to that would be the you know what, what's become a increasing phenomenon of mindfulness, um, which is that we become in a way more self aware that we notice more what's going on within us and notice more what's going on around us. Um, but I'm not sure that's getting after the same phenomenon. Like you, I'm an optimist. I, I think that people can grow um, through their ordinary experiences. But what seems to happen with people who go through uh, extreme situations um, is that they, they grow exponentially. They grow in a way that's quite different um, to just simply trundling along and, and, and developing. Um, and it's that transformation that, that's very, very interesting. Um, we're not clear at the moment whether it's universal. Um, there's all sorts of, of the uh, statistics out there, 
Um, but even uh, Tadashi and Kalun, who were uh, the first people to describe this phenomenon, wouldn't say that it's universal um, uh, by by any means. Um, and but that could be because people simply get stuck in their circumstances. Mm -hmm. So to summarise, we've got. 90, 91, 92 percent of the population um, who will go through a you know a very very nasty situation by any standards. Um, who a year later, eighteen months later, may be quite profoundly changed by that, may be quite profoundly impacted by that, but they're not symptomatic of anything that's clinical, and nothing remarkable has happened that requires clinical intervention. Um, clinically, nowadays we adopt a process called watchful waiting. We leave people alone. Because the more you tinker, the more you poke at the memories, the more likely they are to um, uh, to become problematic. So you actually uh, keep people at arm's length and let them get on with it. There are some things that will contribute to their recovery, and we can talk about that um, at another stage. Mm. Um, but there, I'm thinking about social support and friendship networks and so on and so forth, people around them. Um, the 9%, the 8% who are symptomatic might need a little bit of help. Um, six months later, they might need a lot of help. Um, and again, the majority we would anticipate would get better, but we need to focus on um, thinking about symptoms, not necessarily being um, uh, leading to a particular label, but rather that people can be symptomatic for many, many, many different reasons. And we need to get after those, those particular reasons. And then around about five to 10 years later, um, a phenomenon called post-traumatic growth may kick in for reasons we don't fully understand yet, um, but which do lead to transcendent change within the person affected. Mm. Well, as you've um, indicated, Graham, there are a lot of things there that I want to talk with you about in, in a future um, conversation. Um, and I've got about 10 questions that uh, just come in my head now, and I'm going to have a whole lot more. But as we finish, can if other people that are listening to this are really interested in learning more about resilience, are there easy places that they can go find information? Um, is it just a matter of getting a search engine and then typing in resilience or resilience and growth? I mean, do you have a simple recommendation at this point for people? Uh, Google is always our friend. Resilience and distress, resilience and um, psychology um, will lead you to uh, a very huge plethora of literature, which is confusing and sometimes contradictory um, and comes from particular viewpoints. To be honest, um, one of the best ways of going about this is to think about mindfulness. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of the day, where we end up with all of our clients, where we end up with in all of the laboratories, is people noticing their own condition, but noticing very, very specific things. Do I tend to be a ruminator? Do I tend to be a worry wart? Do I tend to be um, overly optimistic? Are my views too rigid, too fixed? Um, am I too sensitive to the possibility of change? Those sorts of questions um, are going to get you a lot further if you ask them honestly and ask them possibly with the help of a friend, not even necessarily a counsellor, but just a friend, um, rather than getting too far into the literature. Um, I think between us, we're going to provide a, an academic source of, uh, of literature for people um, if they're wanting that. Um, but caveat emptor, be, be, um, all of what you're reading will come from a particular point of view. Um, the science of this is still um, contended, still under debate. Uh, but it sounds like it's very interesting and exciting as well because there's so much diversity um so graham indeed thank yeah. you so much for your time today and we will indeed talk again on other aspects of resilience and uh so it just remains for me to thank you for the time and but thanks very much for today you're welcome goodbye thank you for joining us with the resilience interview today you'll find more interviews at the resilience check-in website and there you'll also find discussions, information and services connected to resilience. So I look forward to seeing you there.